communicate to you. And the way that he does that is with the word, as I employ it, God the Father, well, he's moving by the Spirit, and the Spirit is going to draw you at the end of our time together to lead your way of life and actually determine to follow God's plan for your life. And that would be consecrated. Jesus, he described it this way. He said that there's a devil, and that he, the devil, came to kill, destroy, and to steal. And in other words, the enemy, the devil, wants to rip you away from God's path and God's plan. But then Jesus said, I've come to give you life. Life more abundantly. Life to the full. If you choose to, again, at our time together, live that life, it'll be consecrated to Him. And listen, because you're not just a random blob of molecules, but because you truly were created in His image, and because He really does want to do something special in your life, you should slow your hurried holiday pace to recognize He does have, listen, He does have His very, very exclusive will and plan for you. Now, every once in a while somebody says, Bob, it sounds so general when you say, God has a plan for my life. Well, let me make it specific. And from time to time, the church of Fort Lauderdale, they know I do this. I invite you for a moment to just simply consider the imprint on your index finger. You see, if you will take a look at your finger just for a moment even now, you'll realize that that is exclusive to you. And I don't know the last time you took stock in the fact that as exclusive as your fingerprint is, listen, so is exclusive the vein print of your body. That if we could take an image of your vein print, that would be unlike anyone else in this room, anyone else in this world. And listen, if that wasn't enough, if we could scan your retina, that would actually be a shape, a design, just exclusively yours. So the imprint of your finger, your vein cap, your eyeball, everything says God has for you a plan that's exclusively and specifically for you. But that's not all. You see, the Holy Bible... This holy God, this holy life. Well, if you purpose to live it, you end up in the most holy of holy places. A holy place, a holy kingdom. And that holy is in the dedicated sense. You see, if you've lived as long as I have, and you don't even have to live that long to come to this conclusion, but if you did know, life's not all that it's cracked up to be here on planet Earth. And there'll be times where you'll just kind of have one of those days where after the fact you go, there's got to be something more. Why do I feel so... And you're describing the emptiness. You're describing a futility. You're describing a void. You're longing for a taste of heaven here on earth. But while on earth that longing desire, well, the Holy Bible, the Holy God, the Holy Life, the Holy Place, the Holy Spirit, like this. Consider the things that are being said, and at the end of our time together, say, you know what? I, I, I believe you're saying something. And I believe right now, he's saying something to me, and he's drawing himself closer, even now as I speak. For those who don't know, listen, Holy Bible, Holy God, Holy Life, Holy Place, Therein lies the problem. And the problem has everything to do with me, with we. Listen, we're not holy. We're not holy. And every act of rebellion, every decision that's outside of the perfect will that God has for us, well, that's a reflection of our antagonistic attitude toward Him. Yeah, it's not hard for us these days to admit or to confess that something is truly, truly missing. But what does the Bible say? Listen, in Hebrews, specifically the 12th chapter and the 14th verse, God says that without holiness, no one will see Him. We can't see the Lord without holiness. So, Bob, that's the good news? 
listen, listen. It's what this celebration is all about. The good news happened. The very first Christmas. It's Luke's Gospel. It's the second chapter. Oh, you'll see it on the screen. We start this time. Luke chapter 2 in verse 8. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord showed around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be for all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you, you will find a big wrath, in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, good will toward men. Oh, somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I'll tell you why. Because this is so much more than happy holidays. Oh, I don't know about you, but when people are forced to be Himself. He has this blood of 
the Father to meet the need in your life because He's also Christ alone. And when I say Christ alone, I'm hoping that you understand there is no one else because He, according to the Hebrew word, is Messiah. He, according to the Greek language, is Christos. And what does that mean? And come a little closer. Listen to this. It means He's the only one who can give you a peace that surpasses understanding. There are times in life you don't get it. There's times in life you are shattered on the inside and you're screaming for something that will calm the storm. That's what Jesus is in the business of doing. In the same way, He promised to give us a mercy for all our foolishness. I don't know the last time you did something really, really lame or really, really boneheaded and after the fact you felt that thing on the inside and you're hoping that thing will go away. How does it go away? Well, you can always say you're sorry to the person you offended, but after the fact you still know there's something not right. Why is it we know something's not right after we've done something so foolish? Listen, that's the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will come along the outside of you and whisper in, drawing you closer to Himself, trying to get your attention. And sometimes when you go through that difficulty after the fact and say, how can I feel free? How can I feel clean? You don't realize but that that's a job exclusive for Christ alone, who gives the peace, who gives the mercy, who gives the joy inexplicable. I find it fascinating. But I know so many who, during this Christmas season, are not running to the mall to get the next thing, are not searching through the catalog to find the right thing. They're not even preoccupied with making sure they spend what the budget says they can spend on Christmas. Why? There's this contentment on the inside. And where does that contentment come from? It comes from knowing that Christ is the reason for the season and all the other stuff. We must be careful. If not, it takes us away and takes us so far away we feel like we're getting ripped off on the journey. Listen, He, we read, the saving Son, Christ alone, and conclusively, the risen Lord. And here's where I need your undivided attention. It was just this week that I was talking to a friend of mine. They were talking about people they come in contact with during this Christmas season and how in the dialogue about life and afterlife, too often there's this, well, I just don't know. And as I heard him say that, he said to me, Bob, it puzzles me that today, especially in the United States of America, we have this Holy Bible. We can know this Holy God. We can certainly see it's evidenced by those who have chosen to follow Him. There's a life far better than the life that you've been living if you're not. And to actually know that you know that you know that you know that you can go to heaven. And still... And still, and yet you still choose to stay just that far away from Him that you miss it? Do you know what it's like for me as a pastor to meet with those who, after they say goodbye to a loved one, are wondering where that person's at? And you find out that that, ex that person actually went to a church service. You find out that they maybe went to a Christmas celebration or an Easter celebration, and then you say to them, well, do you know if they did anything after I preached or after that pastor shared his message? Well, I really don't know. And here's what I'm thinking. If at this time in life, you've really come to the place where you can know this knowable God. If you've come to this place where you can be certain of an eternity that according to His Word is a place that you wouldn't want to miss, how is it and why is it there are still way too many unanswered questions? 
It's our prayer. That's Calvary Chapel. Doing this service, and I hope you know too, it has not been at cost to you. It's not a, hey, now we'll be passing the plate and expecting you to cough it up for the celebration. It, it hasn't been, hey, uh, the toll road, you know. It hasn't been, hey, the parking lot. Everything has been paid for so you can invite your friend, so that friend you can come, and then you can just hear this message. Why? It's the heart of God to one more time hear you, hear, have you hear him say, peace, goodwill toward all. What he wants you to know. More than anything else is what he wants you to know. And what will happen in just a moment is that I will invite the band back up. We will begin to sing a song. And if you're somebody who here today says, I think I get it. There's this holy Bible, this holy God, a holy way to live and a holy place to go to after I die. But I am not holy. I don't want to be caught unawares. I don't have to be anymore. I don't have to be a shepherd in the field feeling fear because there's this angelic visitation. No, because of the fact that the saving son is reaching in my, he's reaching in your direction right now to grab you. And because Christ alone is the one who can do what needs to be done to save you from your sins. And because he is in fact the risen Lord, I would pray that this study and our time together brings any curiosity to a close. And you go, you know what? More than anything else right now, I want to make peace with God. This is now a holy place. And this is a holy place to accomplish this holy work. For with the Holy Spirit here, touching your heart, moving your mind, drawing you close, He can do what I can't do. And I pray, Father, do this right now. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you so much for a time to consider your heart. Consider it according to this, your word. And as we're reminded of what the Christmas story is all about, this heavenly host declaring glory on, to God in the highest, on, on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Lord, we pray this day, right now, that this entire service, drawing those who need to know, those who want to make peace, Lord, make this the best season for them that there can possibly be because you can right now do what I can do and that is gift to them the gift of eternal life. Lord, this we ask in Jesus' name. Before I say amen, we're maintaining an attitude of prayer and in just a moment, Andrew's going to lead us in song and at that moment, I'm going to invite you to do something a little out of the ordinary, especially for a stadium service and with one as filled as this one is. I'm going to invite you to make a decision for Jesus Christ. I'm going to invite you in just a moment out of your seat and down an aisle where you will eventually make it right here. Right here. And then we will pray a prayer together. The prayer is what we as Christians affectionately call a sinner's prayer. And the reason we call it a sinner's prayer is when you admit that you're a sinner. It's when you simply say, yes, I have fallen short of the glory of God. In other words, I've missed the mark. In other words, I'm not good enough to get to heaven without his help. I know I'm unholy. If he can make me holy, I'm ready to be holy. And when you meet me here, right here, and I lead you in words, and the words sound like this, today God, I open my heart, I invite you inside, I want to follow you, forgive me of my sins. When you pray that kind of prayer right here, here's what he does. The Bible says that he actually opens a book called the Lamb's Book of Life, and he actually writes your name in it. So that at the very end of the age, he can check the pages, and he can see, and you will say, yes, I know you, I know you. Now, obviously the book is for us symbolic. He knows that he knows that he knows your decision. But you need to know that you know your decision, and you need to know it so sufficiently that there is no doubt and there is no denying that this happened in your life today. So, 
while the band plays. If you are somebody invited by a friend or a loved one here tonight, you go, you know what, I want to make right with God. Well, I'm going to invite you right now to come forward. Whatever floor you're on, all the way around, you're going to see people with flashlights. Go out your exit, follow the flashlights right here. And while we sing, 